Alrighty, thank you all for joining. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for all those that are listening later at a later date online on Torah anytime. So tonight, with tonight, we're learning Leiluni Shmat Avram Ben Chaim Yehuda and Yechazkel Ben Arab Avram. We are also <coughs> learning Leiluni Leofash Lemat to Chavabat Chaya Esther. So tonight, before we actually some of this stuff may be disturbing for people that are not so involved in the news. So that being said, I don't know if disturbing, scary, frightening, maybe that's a better word to use. So what we're going to do is, is I, I, we're going to give a little bit of introduction uh, before we get into the, into the current events uh, uh, you know, topic. And that is actually in this week's Parsha. So this week's Parsha speaks about uh, Avram Avinu and his his guest. So in Bereshit chapter 18 verse 5, the Pasuk tells us, Ve'ekha <coughs> pas lechem. Avram Avinu is telling his guests, take, take uh, um, this uh, uh, sli- uh, piece of bread, v'sadu libchem, and that you should sustain your hearts, veru, uh, that since you passed by, and we're going to explain this a little bit in more depth, ki al vartem al avdechem, you passed by your servant, which is referring to himself, v'yoymru kein katasak ashadibata, and they responded, this you should do as just like you, you spoke. So let's try to explain this dialogue. This dialogue is very, very interesting, and this dialogue is as follows. This dialogue is Avram sees these three guests, angels, passing by. He didn't know that they were angels, but he sees these three three people passing by. And he goes over to them and he says, you know, you guys have to come and you guys have to eat with, uh, you know, eat the meal uh, by me. Why? Because you pass by me. And the angels responded, yes, we should do just like, just like you said. Now we see over here, this is a very, very interesting, di- that's like, as if you're walking past by somebody and say, you know, like, since you're here, might as well as 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 go and uh, join me uh, join me for for a meal, and the idea where Avram Avinu is is uh, is telling the the malachim is that he's telling he's telling the angel he says there's nothing that happens for nothing happens for nothing meaning that there's a reason for everything and if there's a reason for everything there is a reason also that why you're here right now meaning that. The fact that you're here right now is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent you, and hence, please come and eat the meal uh, with me. And uh, the angel responded, you said, good, we'll eat the meal with you. The, 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 idea, the idea that is so important for tonight is to realize that nothing happens for no reason. There is a purpose, there is a reason, there is a manik, there is someone who is orchestrating everything, and that is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We see this, Rabbi Friend explains, we see this also in Miguel's Esther. Miguel's Esther, when, uh, when Mordechai tells Esther, go and speak to Ahasuerus. And Esther said, if I go and speak to Ahasuerus, it's a death sentence. He didn't call me. And we know that if he didn't call the person to come and the person comes, that's a death sentence. And Mordechai said, this is what you are put in the off. This is what you are put as being as queen for. Mordechai said, do you think it was a happenstance? Do you think it was a just happened to be that you, out of all the women, you were chosen? And Esther could have responded, no, it wasn't a happenstance. I was the most beautiful person. But she didn't respond that. You know what she said? She said, you're right. Even though there are things that look al pider it looks like it's nature. And it looks like things are going the way that they ought to go and they need to go. We still have to realize that there is a divine hand. There's Ashkach pratis. And Mordechai, this is what Mordechai tells Esther. This is the reason that you became queen. And if this is the reason that you became queen, you have to realize that God put you in this situation for a reason. And that's what Avram Avinu was telling the, the angels. He said that Hashem put you in this situation for a reason. Every situation that we are in, we are in for a reason. There was a story that in uh, Poland, before before the war, uh, there was a custom amongst the Gera Hasidim that if somebody from the community would m- not have enough money to pay rent, all the, the entire Gera community will pull together their money and they will pay the rent for this person that was about to be evicted. So one time it so happened that this uh, this this Gera Hasid, he didn't have enough money and he wasn't able to pay rent. The interesting part of it was, is that the landlord was none other than also a Gerach Hasid. So this, this Gerach Hasid, the landlord, went over to the rabbi, the Imre Emes, and uh, to the Gerach Rebbe, and he, and he said, you know, the person that I want to evict 
is a Gerach Hasid. Am I allowed to evict him? So the Rebbe says, no, you're not allowed to evict me. You, 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 can't, you can't evict uh, you know, you know, a Jewish person. So the Gerach Hasid said, you know, the landlord said, okay, fine. So let everybody pool their money together and pay me just like they do for everybody else. And the Rebbe told him, says, no, 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 no. In this situation, no one's pulling in the money. He says, you have to carry the burden by yourself. And ask the, the, the landlord, ask the Gerach says, why? Why is that fear? How is that fear? He says, if it would be somebody else out of the community, if it would have been a non-Jew, we would have all pulled our money together and we would have paid for the Gerach So why? Because I'm the landlord? This is my parnasa. This is how I'm supposed to survive. I am now supposed to take the burden upon myself? So the Gerach responded, that if HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if God put you in this situation and you're the landlord, you have to know that there's a reason for it. And there's a reason that you're replaced in this test. And if so, you have to carry the burden yourself. And this is the message that Avram Avinu was telling the, say, the, the, the angels, the Malachim, in this week's parasha. Saying that you have to, if you pass by over here, nothing happens for no reason. No, everything happens for a reason. With that information, with that background, we can begin to discuss the idea of the rise of anti-Semitism. Everything that we deal with is always in the parasha. It's crazy crazy how you can find and you don't even have to look that hard that's the crazy part that anything in current events you could just look inside and you could find uh, um, you know information on this on the weekly parsha so we know that anti uh, um, Semitism has risen to to high high uh, levels and if someone is not aware of that then you should skip to the end of this year because we're going to present a lot of information that might be a little bit unsettling. And uh, uh, I, the reason for that is not to scare anybody. The reason for that is not to bring anybody to any uh, harm or any uh, fear, but rather it's to understand what we need to do. How do we intake this? How do we understand when we read the news regarding this subject and any subject for that matter? So the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, was tracking this, and they saw a 400% increase in anti-Semitic incidents since the same time last year. 400% increase. And we see this all over America and all over the world. In America, we see in Los Angeles, there was somebody who attempted to break into a, person, to, to a Jewish family's home, and they were screaming, free Palestine and kill the Jews. In the, and that was October 25th. October 10th, Los Angeles, California also. There was a, in a kosher restaurant, somebody came in shouting, I am Hamas. And he made death threats to the Jewish people sitting down over there. In Clifton, New Jersey, there was a car with individuals that were holding the Palestinian flag. They were, they were intentionally swerving, trying to hit, or almost trying to hit, a Jewish family that was walking nearby. That was on October 8th. October 15th, New York, there was a person that, that, that punched a woman, a Jewish woman, in the face in Grand Central Terminal in Manhattan. And she responded, she says, why did you do that? And his response were three words, you are Jewish, period. And the, that is the reason why I assaulted you. That is the reason why you got punched in the face. We see this on, on college camp, campuses all over, the, all over America. This is the future of Americans. In Cornell University, the, pol the police had to be stationed in front of the Center of Jewish Living to, to, to uh, prevent people from, from jumping in over there. There were posts online that threatened Jewish students that they would be shot. And the, I, the, when you think about this, we're in 2023. Who would have ever imagined that in an Ivy League school, the Jewish kids would not be able to sit in the dining room with the non-Jewish kids? Like, who would have ever thought in the most liberal country, in a country that's trying to have equality, who would have thought this level would rise so fast? And the threats weren't light threats. The threats were, were, were like really specific. They, the, the threats online were like, if you see a Jew, follow them home and then kill them. Uh, and I'm saying that in a nice way, by the way. Uh, the, uh, or, or another threat was, I'm going to go and shoot up 104 West. And then they went on in other very particulars that I'm not going to describe, uh, you know, on the share. But they were, you know, saying what they will do to Jewish females and Jewish babies, which is not tickle at play with them and, you know, you know, give them, you know, compliments. That was not what they were saying. And this is, uh, you know, unsurprising for Cornell because, uh, after all, a Cornell professor called what Hamas did exhilarating. Uh, so, so it's a little bit unsurprising, but then again, surprising at the at the at the, at the same point. The there were protests in a uh, New York City college that the, the the Jewish kids they were scared. They were scared for their lives. You know what the the university again. This is a, allegedly whatever it is, but I 
you know, I'm going to take it as, as you know, as, as a fact that the university told the Jewish people, if you want to be feel safe, go hide in the attic. This is what the New York City College is telling Jewish people who are complaining we're scared because people are threatening us and people are not only threatening us, they're rallying and protesting against us and the university said, well, if you're scared, you could go to the attic and you could hide. What is this, Nazi Germany? Like, this is 2023 in a free America. And of course, we don't have to mention how many you know colleges, campuses have the you know the the, the slogan from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine will be free, which again it is annihilation, destroying and and uh, uh, removing Israel from the map. Uh, other colleges had swastikas and other things spray painted everywhere, and our. Ivy League School of America, Harvard, is, the, there was a video that came out, I saw it today, I don't know when it, when it actually came out, but I saw it today, where you see a Jewish kid is walking just by themselves, not instigating anything, and a bunch of protesters, pro-Palestinian protesters, they come at him and they, with, you know, with huge scarves, with huge blankets, and they, and they box him in. It's almost getting physical and not from the Jewish side. And this is in the universities, in the free speech, in, in, in America, which is crazy. This is 2023. And this is what we have to deal with. And it's not just America. In, you know, Canada, the prime minister on October 17, said that there was a scary rise in anti-Semitism in Canada. In Argentina, there was an Argentinian man that was arrested. Why? Because he called on attacks on Jewish children in schools. That's what he was calling attacks on. In Brazil, there was graffiti on, on shuls, on synagogues, and the, the comments of, like, Hitler didn't finish, he should have finished killing the Jews. 2023, in Argent in Brazil. Uh, in Britain, again, can't be surprised if Britain, the amount of, of, uh, of Muslims that they just let enter, or illegally or illegally into their country, with 100,000, uh, you know, people protesting pro-Palestine for pro-Hamas and pro gen Pro, pro like murder of babies, there was a 14-fold increase in anti-Semitism in France. And again, bear with me, we're going to get, there's a point for where I'm going with all this. France, since October 7, there has been 819 anti-Semitic acts. This compares with 436 for the whole of 2022. It hasn't even been a month. You're talking about three weeks. There has been more anti-Semitic acts than the entire year of 2022 in France. In Paris, there was about 60 Mug and David, the stars of David that were painted on Jewish homes. Again, these are things that happen in Nazi Germany. In Germany, while well, speaking about Germany, there was a 240% increase on anti-Semitic incidents. In the Netherlands, which again, I'm surprised I wasn't aware that there were Jewish people in the Netherlands, but in the Netherlands, the children, these are children has been have been harassed. There were comments that were Hamas was right and they should have done it earlier. This who would say that after a brutal massacre? Which human being that considers themselves human would say such things? In Russia, which I'm sure this is this has been very popular, there was an angry crowd that stormed the airport in Russia, and they were searching for, for, for Jews after a plane arrived from Tel Aviv. And you see there, the, the, there was a bunch of videos that came out of it. One of the videos was a, a video of an angry mob running through the airport, and one of them was a kid, a little kid, right in the front. And the little kid was saying, kill the Jews, find the Jews, and kill the Jews. That's what the little kid was saying in Russia. This is not in, in Palestine. This is, not, this is in Russia. This is to the point that even the National Security Council, uh, the spokesman, John Kirby, he compared this to the Jewish pogroms in the 19th and 20th century. Chinese social media, or China in itself, they are suggesting that the Nazi, Holo Holo the Nazi Holocaust was justified, and the, the killing the Jews were, were, were right. And not that this makes a big difference, because who cares what's on China's maps, but China took off Israel on their maps. I believe that was today also. And if you think, okay, that's in China, who really cares? You look at the people that are ripping off the posters of the Jewish kidnapped people. Surprisingly, quite few of them are Asian. Uh, the th making threats on Jewish life, again, Asian. The people, the person that made uh, 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 you know, a threat that was arrested in Cornell University, not Muslim. Go look what type of nationality he's coming from. I'm not saying that it's all of them like that. Of course not. But we see that it has it has an effect. Uh, you know, the the Bolivia that they they severed completely the diplomatic ties with Israel. Chile and Colombia are not too far behind. We see throughout the entire world there's a rise of anti-Semitism, and the result is 
people are getting scared. And, and I'm the reason why I'm actually speaking about this topic is about because of the questions that I've gotten in the past week, where people are asking, you know, can I should I get guns? Is it a problem to get guns? Uh, what should I do with my mezuzah? Do I have to hide being Jewish? Can I walk in the street with a yarmulke? What am I supposed to do? do I, you know, these are real questions that people are asking. There are shuls that are being closed, uh, not in America, Baruch Hashem, but like throughout the world, where where Jewish day schools are being canceled. People are removing mezuzahs from their doors. So we have to try to understand, you know, like, how are, we, how are we supposed to process this information? We would think that after the horrific attacks of October 7th in Israel, people would be like, okay, you know what? There is a hatred for Jews. We got to side with the Jews. And that's what anybody in their right mind would say. But yet we see the opposite. And of course, we can't, you know, just, just fly by and focus on the negative. There has been tremendous amount of Israel support, and we thank and appreciate everybody that has. But you know, for that we don't need to give. A, we give a class. We give. You know, there's an appreciation that we have for the people that are supporting the Jewish people. There, we have an appreciation for people that are supporting the state of Israel. We have an appreciation for people that are standing up as terrorists, even though that sounds like an idiotic statement that you don't have to say. But apparently, we do have to say that now that we have to be thankful for people that stand up against murder of innocent men, women, and children. So, when we look at anti-Semitism historically, this is not new. This is not something that's new to 2023. This has been since the beginning of time. Hate crimes, in fact, by religion, which was tracked by the United States from 1992 to 2019, the anti-Jewish hate crimes was on top of the list. In fact, that if you take all the other anti-religion hate crimes of all the other religions and you combine them together, Jewish anti, you know, well, let's just call it anti-Semitism, was greater than all the others combined. And FBI released the annual hate crime statistics, and it showed that between 2021 and 2022, remember, this is not 2023 yet, anti-Semitic hate crime rose by 36%. This is before even October 7th, has, has been, has been on, a, on a rise. And just when we're speaking about anti-Semitism, it's good to notate, to, to realize that if you have a uh, uh, um, hate or or any any issues against any other race, you're not called you're called a racist. The only one that has their own title is Jewish people. It's so it's so common that they had to make their. It's not even a racist anymore. Now you're anti-Semitic. There is an its own category. Now throughout throughout if you look throughout history of the reasons and and this is Jews really study this and be like wait a minute why are we being hated? Maybe there's something that we're doing wrong. Maybe there's something that we have to we could change. Right? Like a good good Jewish person if something is wrong that's going on instead of always fighting back with force we have to look internally and be like okay well maybe there is something that we need to change and and throughout history Jewish people looked at reasons common reasons of why there is anti-Semitism. So it started off with that economic theory. You know why people hate Jews? Because they're wealthy. They got money. But then we look at history. Before the 17th century, most Jews were poor and segregated. They didn't have any money, and yet they were still hated. And if you're not you know, so sure about it, look at all the pogroms, look at the Holocaust. There's, you know, th there was plenty of, plenty of hatred when they didn't have any money. So then they would think, and again, I'm going to go through these really quickly because it's not the point of this year, but it's good to understand uh, and, and remember how these reasons are kind of irrelevant. Then people thought, maybe it's because Jewish people have power. After all, look at all the conspiracy theories. Jewish people control the government. Jewish people control media. Jewish people have too much power, and that's why there is anti-Semitism in the world. Well, let's look a little bit back into history. In 1917, the Ukrainians and the Russians, they massacred 200,000 Jews in almost 500 pogroms. If the Jewish people would be in power, don't you think we would have not let that happen? In 1915, Grand Duke Nicholas, commander-in-chief of the Russian army, had 100,000 Jews murdered. Again, if we would have the power, do you not think that we would have stopped this? The Spanish Inquisition, the, this, the, the Christian Crusades, the Holocaust. I mean, we could go on and on, but it's very obvious that if Jewish people, the reason that we're being hated is because we hold power. You look at history, there's no reasons to support that because e when we didn't have power or when even people thought we had power, we obviously didn't have power and yet we were still hated. Then there's another theory called the outsider theory, because Jews are different. We don't like people that are different, and that's why the Jewish people are hated. Well, let's look at the 18th century through the Enlightenment period, when the Jewish people, unfortunately many of them, 
they changed their way they dressed, they shaved their beards, they adopted the language of whatever they were, wherever they were located, they intermarried, they went to college and universities, they became more French than the French. And what happened after that? Well, let's look at the German Jewry. In the century that was right before the Holocaust, most the, this was known as the, the most assimilated Jewish community in history, until, unfortunately, present America. But until this, the most assimilated Jewish community in history was the German Jewry before the Holocaust. And you know what kind of stopped it? It was the Nuremberg Laws. The Germans said, no, we don't want you to intermarry with us. We're the Aryan race, and you're going to contaminate us. Intermarriage rate at that point in time before the Nuremberg Laws was 42%. Conversion to Christianity was widespread. So it can't be because we were different, because the Holocaust proved that even when we were different and we, and we were not different, we acted like everybody else, Hitler, the Nazis, the Germans, and many of the world stood silent why, while six million Jewish people were murdered, brutally murdered. So there's another theory, the chosen people theory. You know why there's anti-Semitism? Because the Jewish people, they, 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 they say that they're the chosen people. And no one likes to be the one that brags and says that they're the chosen people. Well, let's just look at Germany and Austria before the war, where the German people rejected the fact that they were chosenists. They said Berlin is our Jerusalem, and that's a quote. But what happened after that? You think, okay, then we'll welcome you with open arms. No, the Holocaust, six million. So the Jews are hated because they're chosen. The Jews are hated because they assimilate. The Jews are hated for any reason and any reason in between. There's other reasons that they killed, you know, JC. We don't have to get into that reason. That only happened several centuries after JC was was you know was gone. But I want to focus on another uh, a theory, and that theory that theory is called the scapegoat theory. The scapegoat theory was that every, people don't like accepting blame on themselves. They like to put blame on somewhere else. And Hitler was, you know, like he had to put blame. We, German lo Germany lost World War I. They lost World War II. They needed to put blame on someone. So who are they going to put the blame on? Let's put the blame on the Jews. So they put the, uh, the, the blame on, they put the blame on, on the Jews. And the, when they put the blame on the Jews, the idea behind it is so like, Unfathomable. Like the Jews were only a 0.8% of the German population. So when you think, oh, yeah, we're going to put the blame on the Jews, how are we going to go? And how, like, how is that going to float? No, people took it and they loved it. They, they, you know, they, they, they went inside over there with such, like, uh, uh, um, they, they, they came inside over there with such a, like, yeah. For sure, we are going to go, and we're going to go and, and blame the Jews, and it went. And the Jewish pe and the German people, they they you know they ate it up. Something that's like hard to begin to understand. Like how how could that work? So when we look at this, we have to look at this from a few different points of uh you know few different points of view. So when we look at the anti-Semitism throughout throughout the history, we were hated because we had too much money. And then when we didn't have enough money, we were hated because we were too poor. We were hated because we had too much power. And then we had hated when we didn't have any power. We were hated because we looked different. And then we were hated because we looked like everyone else. We were hated because we were chosen. And then we were hated when we gave up that claim and say, no, we're just like everybody else. The Jewish people were hated for 2,000 years when we didn't have a state. And now a state of Israel. And now we're hated because we do have a state of Israel. So then when you look at the reason that history has been trying to, you know, learn and, and, and understand where the historians were trying to look at, we realize that none of them are actual and factual and none of them are actually the reason. So then we start, we stop and we think, then what is the reason that there is anti-Semitism and why is it rising right now? So when things don't make sense to the normal way of logical thinking and logical analysis, then we have to start thinking outside the regular normal box of thinking that we're stuck in. And we have to realize, and this is where we started off, that everything is from Hashem.
Everything that happens is from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's what, what Avram Avinu was, was explaining to the angels. That no matter what happens, no matter where you are, there is a reason why you are here. And there is a reason why this is happening. There is a reason why this is happening now in 2023. And there is a reason why it happened in you know the 1930s in the Holocaust. And there is a reason why it happened in 1915 in Russia, 1917 in Russia and Ukraine. There is a reason why this happened in the Spanish Inquisition of, of 1492. And there is a reason why this happened in the Crusades. In, you know, almost of a thousand years ago, and the reasons is not because the answer to the to these reasons are not that oh yeah we have to guard ourselves we have to arm ourselves we have to remove those, those, those. we have to do what we have to do again we have to do our shadows but that's not going to solve the problem there is a root of the problem that we have to figure out we have to uncover and we have to look into we have to know the first step we have to know that Hakadosh Baruch Hu God loves us. And the difficulty during the times of, of, of war and during the times of massacre of the Jewish people, we think, okay, wait a minute, you know, like, does God not like us anymore? Does God does, like hate us anymore? And the answer is no. HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us. And when you ask anybody, be like, wait a minute, this is not what love looks like. I know, and anybody in a healthy relationship, like, you know what, this is not what love looks like. I love my child. I will never do this to my child. So if we're saying that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loved us, then where is Hashem's love during this time? Time. When we have been massacred, 14, 1,500 people, uh, hopefully the, 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 the number is not going to go up, but f- so many people have been massacred, Jewish people have been massacred, and not only that, the Jewish nation, the, the other nations of the world are, ba- are are teaming up against us. We have to stop and think, like, wait a minute, does HaKadosh Baruch Hu not love us? And the answer is a big fat no. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does love us. So then we have to ask, where is Hashem's love, and how do we understand the situation that is happening in Israel and all over the world? So, there. imagine that there were a bunch of thugs, let's call them terrorists, that broke into someone's home, and they tied everybody up, and they were starting to steal things, and they were threatening to kill somebody, and then a heroic neighbor jumps in, in his ninja costume, and he starts beating up all the terrorists, throwing you know Chinese stars and whatnot, and, and scaring off all the terrorists, and the terrorists run away, and the thieves run away. What would you tell this neighbor who just saved your, you know, your life, your finances, everything that you had, just, just saved everything? You would praise this, this neighbor. You, anything that this neighbor wanted for the rest of this neighbor's life, it's, it's done. It's taken care of. The amount of a car stuff of gratitude that I have for this neighbor that saved from these thugs, from these terrorists, from these thieves. But what if you find out? What if you find out that the neighbor staged the whole thing? The neighbor called a bunch of thugs and says, listen, I'm going to pay you. Pretend to rob these people, tie them up, pretend to be really brutal, and I'm going to come in and I'm going to say, I want some brownie points of these people. So you go in and, and tie them up and threaten them, and I'm going to come in, I'm going to save the day. And then they're going to be in debt for me for forever. What if you found out that that's what the neighbor did? Are you going to be like, okay, the neighbor, whatever they want forever? Be like, are you kidding me? No, I am moving today. I do not want to be next to a psychopath like this. Are you kidding me? Somebody that goes and orchestrates this entire thing and I have to be grateful for this person? That's what you would say to a neighbor or or a friend or somebody that lives near you that orchestrated this type of event. So we have to ask a dangerous question. And the dangerous question is, who sent these terrorists to Gaza. The Greeks, who sent them against the Yidin? Haman, who sent Haman against the Jewish people? The Egyptians, Paro, who sent the Egyptians against the Jewish people? And the answer in all those cases is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the questions that many people ask, we go, wait a minute, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent the threat towards us and then he saved us for the threat. So why do we go and thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu who sent us the threat? Because what, what is all our holidays is there was a threat and HaKadosh Baruch Hu saved us for the threat. But wait a minute, HaKadosh Baruch Hu also sent us the threat. So why are we being thankful? Why are we being grateful? Why are we being happy? Why are we celebrating? It's a great question that many people ask. But like, wait a minute, why do we have to be grateful? Why do we have to be thankful if the, if the origin, the reason of the threat came from the, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the source that saved us? A dangerous question, if you don't know the answer. <laughs> but the answer is a very fascinating and very obvious answer. What would have happened if the Greeks, the cruel Greeks, wouldn't come against us? You know what would have happened to the Jewish nation? We would have been Hellenized. We would have assimilated. What would have happened if Haman didn't go? The nation was, was, was spread out. It was spread out throughout the entire, the entire civilized world. What would have happened if Haman didn't come? What would have happened if the, the 
paranoid Paro wasn't so paranoid against the Jewish people. What would happen? The Jewish people, they were worshipping idols and they were worshipping idols. What would have happened to the Jewish people? You know what would have happened? If the Greeks wouldn't have come out against us, we would have been Greek. If the Haman wouldn't have come out against us, we would have been Persian. If Paro didn't come against us, we would have been Egyptian. When we look at history, you look at Spain, for example. In 15th century Spain, 20th century Germany, 21st century American. You know what's a underlining factor in anti-Semitism? I'm not saying this is the main reason, but this is definitely a reason that, that you should think about. Anti-Semitism keeps the Jewish people from disappearing. Anti-Semitism kept the, the Jewish people from disappearing during the Hanukkah miracle, during the Greeks. It kept during the Persian Empire in Haman. It kept us as Jews when Paro was in, in, in Egypt in, Par, in Paro's time. So anti-Semitism keeps the Jewish people from completely disappearing into society, into annihilation, into, into oblivion, into just in, into the chulen pot of the world. The, expo- the, the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492, this, was, this happened after Jews for centuries were flourishing, professionally, politically, economically. And in a year, bef- uh, 100 years, I'm sorry, about almost 100 years, in 1391, a full, almost a full century before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, there was an uprise, an anti, there was an anti-Jewish violence that erupted. And as a response, because of the anti-Semitic attacks that happened in Spain, a full century before the expulsion of the Jews, many, many Jews, in fact, over the next 50 years, more than half the, Sp- the Spanish Jewry converted to Christianity. And they were secretly practicing Jewish rites, but they converted. Out, out, outside, they, outside, they converted. The, expo- the expulsion of the Jewish people in Spain, this is the Sephardic Jews, the, the, the 200,000 Jews were, were you know, expelled from, uh, you know, from Spain in 1492. 150 thousand of them chose to leave. They went to North Africa, they went to Turkey, to Holland, to Israel. And many of them actually went and ended up going to Tzfas, which is a lot of Mikubalim, you know, came out from that. You know what would have happened if there wasn't these anti-Semitic attacks? They were, if there wasn't, the Spanish jury would have ceased to exist to a certain extent. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent this to say, like, I am saving you from you. In Egypt, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent us, the Egyptians, to save us from us. For, and the same thing happened in Persia and Haman. And the same thing happened in the Crusades. The same thing happened in history again and again. The same thing happened in Germany. And this is a, a fact that we have to come to understand. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God loves us more than we can ever imagine. We have to realize that the world is almost 6,000 years old. Only God has all the information, the past lives, the present lives, the future, and how things will play out. We never know the full reason of our sufferings, but we have to realize that it's coming from a loving father. When, when, when a father loves his child so much and he doesn't want them to die out, they do things that are very, very drastic that the child starts asking the question, why, dad? If you love me, why are you doing this to me? And we have to realize that when we look at history, Anti-Semitism is terrible, and I'm not saying it's a good thing, and I'm not saying that it should continue to happen. But there is a reason for what it happened, and Hakadosh Baruch Hu knows the reason. The reasons. One of the reasons we have to realize is that anti-Semitism protects us from being a Jew. When we start getting too comfortable, when we start assimilating, when we start becoming like everybody else, everybody else reminds us, "Hey, by the way, you're Jewish." A famous saying, a beautiful saying, that if the Jewish people do not make Kiddush, if the Jewish people do not make, bring in the holiness, then the non-Jewish people will make Havdalah. Then Havdalah means separation. They will tell you, you are not like us. As much as we try to be, no, we're just like everybody else. We're just like everybody else. The non-Jews will come and say, no, you're not. You're different than everybody else. They don't know the reasons, but I could just borrow when the Jewish people, when we look into history and when we look into the reasons, we can understand the, re- the reasons behind it. Now, with that being said, we have to take into another factor. When we look at the news, and it's very troubling. The news can be very troubling, very, very difficult for people to handle. But we also have to realize that when we read the news and we look at the news, not everything that looks bad is bad. 
And I'll give you an example. This is my own personal thing. But, but you know, you, you can judge for yourself whether you agree with it or not. It's very, very common nowadays that uh, there, there are people throughout the world that they're posting up signs, Jewish people or people that are supporting Israel, posting up signs of hostages that are being held in Gaza throughout the entire world. In America, it's very common. I'm sure it's common throughout the entire Europe and other countries as well. And you have posters of hostages. And then you see these pro-Palestinians, they're going and they're ripping down posters, which is, people get angry. Like, how can you do that? There's a little baby that's taken hostage. They were... Hostage means they were stolen. They were kidnapped from their parents' house and they're placed in some sort of tunnel somewhere in Gaza full of people that only want to kill the Jewish people. These are babies that are placed underground away from their parents and there's just signs that saying bring the kidnapped people home. A sign that everybody could get on board with. Anybody who doesn't want... Who wants kidnapped people? Everybody who has a human being of a mind and a heart would say of course we don't want kidnapped. Yet we see throughout the entire world, people going and they're ripping up these signs. They're ripping down these signs. And Jewish people, and rightfully so, are getting very, ang very angry. What are you doing? Why are you ripping down these signs? How dare you rip down these signs? And what we don't realize, we think that what they're ripping down is very, very terrible for the Jewish people. But I have seen, and I believe uh, this to be true, again, you may argue with me, and it's fine if you do, that what do you think, the, what, what is the idea of placing these posters on there? They're placing these posters, but you know, Hamas is not going to be like, oh, wait a minute, 200,000 posters were placed for the missing people. I guess we could put it, we should bring the, the, you know, the kids home and bring the, all the hostages home. No, Hamas is not going to be like the more posters, they're going to have political pressure and they're going to, you know, release the hostages. That's not what's going to happen with the Hamas. So what are we trying to, uh, you know, you know, prove or, 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 uh, or come into to like some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, effect by placing these, these posters? One of the main reasons is that we're trying to show empathy for the, the entire Jewish world. Like, look what Israel is, is suffering. And it's not just Israel. The entire Jewish world, we're suffering. We have our, we have our brothers, our sisters, our babies that are placed in, in, in a kidnapped cell. Like, we're not happy about it. We want to bring them home. So we're showing the world, look, be empathetic. Look, have some empathy. Now, I'll take it a step further. What do you think the world is going to have more empathy? If there is a full poster of a kidnapped baby over there or if it's ripped and you know in half you know what happens when you have an american citizen nothing to do with judaism nothing to be do with with anything with israel they walk past by and they see a poster that's ripped down and the poster they know very obvious it's about kidnapped people that are kidnapped by terrorists where do you think there's going to be more empathy in a full poster or in a half ripped poster I guarantee you, it's in the half-ripped poster. If there's a half-ripped poster, the, 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 the people are going to be like, wait a minute. But like The hate is not only in, in Israel. The hate is not only in the terrorists. There's hate right over here in America. And you see this all over. And, and, and I'm very grateful to all those Americans that have no connection with Israel. They go and they confront these people that are ripping down these signs. Be like, what are you doing? And you see the anger that they have. We're like, we're not Jewish, but what are you doing? These are kidnapped kids. Why are you ripping down the signs? So the empathy aspect is much greater when people are ripping down the signs. And I'm not saying that Jewish people should go around ripping down the signs. You should definitely not. But the fact that these Palestinians or pro-Palestinians, I think they're doing themselves a favor by ripping down the signs. They're so wrong. They're so wrong. They're helping the Jewish cause. So this is just one example when we look at the news and we look at when something is looking really bad for the Jews, in essence, it's really good for the Jews. And we see throughout the entire America, wherever these posters are being ripped down, Americans are standing up and be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And they're arguing, they're having emotions that they would have never would have had had these people not ripped down these posters. So these pro-Palestinian, uh, you know, supporters, they're ripping down, they think they're doing themselves a favor, they are very much doing a favor for Israel. So we, this is a, a lesson that we have to learn. When we look at history, and we look at the news, and we look at these troubling events that are happening, we don't see the full picture. And if only we stopped and think, we could see how things can spin out very, very different, differently. So we have to realize that not everything that looks bad is bad. And this is the way that we need to process the news. Many people are processing the news in a very, very bad way. And we have to realize that we, every single person throughout the entire world right now is involved in a test. Hashem is testing the entire world. God is testing the entire world. 
For some people, it could be physical fighting in the war. For other people, it's the trauma that they have to deal with. And for other people, it's just absorbing all the hate, the anti-Semitism that the world has is going out there. And we're all in a test. And we have to realize when HaKadosh Baruch Hu tests us, we see what HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Avram Avinu. I told Avram Avinu, Lech Lecha, go out from your land. Avram Avinu was settled. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, no, you have to leave. And why does it say, Lech Lecha, go for, it's, it's like a double ocean, it's a double language, go for yourself, go for you. You know why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God is telling Avram, you are going to go through many, many tests. But you have to know that all these tests are for you. Every single one of us are going through tests, through anti-Semitism, through the news, through the trauma, through the fighting and the war in Israel. Every single one of us that's listening to this class, I guarantee you're going through some sort of test. And we have to realize, even if you're not listening to this class, you're going through some sort of test. We have to realize the test is just like, obviously not the same uh, idea, the test of Avram Avinu, but it's the same underlining concept that when we get tested, we get tested for ourselves. Lech lecha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God is telling us, you're being tested for you. Our test, the anti-Semitism, the difficulties that every single Jew is facing now, and every single pro-Israeli, is it pro-Zionist, or pro-Israeli, whatever it is, right person is facing right now, it's a test for your own benefit. And we have to realize that. Because when we realize that, we ingest the news very, very differently. We, our intake is very, very differently. And the Zohar in Parshas Bechukosai tells us that we have to realize that the children of the, the Bnei Israel, the Jewish people, are very, very beloved by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There is a loving father up in heaven. And when we see difficulties, we tend to sometimes question that. And we have to realize that there is still and there always will be a loving father. And we have to realize and how to internalize these tests and how to take these tests. Step one is to realize that it's coming from a loving place. It's not coming from an evil place. It's not coming from a, from a place from, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu just hates us. It's coming from a very, very loving place. And if we realize that, we're one step closer to be able to respond to that to the correct way. On Purim, we didn't go to war. We did tshuva. On Hanukkah, we went to war. And the question is why? Why is it in the story of Purim, we did tshuva, we went, we fasted for three days, we went and we did tshuva, and Hanukkah, we went to war. So the answer is that Purim, the war against us was against our bodies. Haman wanted to kill us. In Hanukkah, the war was against our soul. They wanted to destroy. They wanted to become, become Hellenized. We, they wanted us to become Greeks. Says the Chavetz Chaim, that when the attack is on our physical bodies, then the only thing we can do is tshuva. And this is what's happening now. The attack is on our physical bodies. Hamas wants to destroy us. The world wants to destroy us. The world is screaming, kill the Jews. Well, not the world. I shouldn't say that because many people are very supporting the, the, you know, the Jewish people. And again, we're super grateful and we have to realize that we're not alone. Even though we're, we, 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 don't, we don't rely on other people, we only rely on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but we have to give appreciation where appreciation is due. And we have many, many people backing us. And Baruch Hashem, America, the Europe, many European nations are, are fully backing Israel, are fully backing the Jewish nation. And we greatly support, we greatly appreciate that. But the Chafetz Chaim says that when the, when the attack is on our physical bodies, and that's, what's, that's the attack, destroy the Jewish people, the only thing we can do is tshuva. The attack was on the secular, the religious, it didn't matter. So when the attack is physical, says the Chafetz Chaim, what we need to do is tshuva. And when we look at through the, 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 the world, and we look at the way people are ingesting this information, we can see the fakeness of it, the 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 ridiculousness of it. The the fake news that comes out of, of Gaza, out of Hamas, was proven time again and again and again and again, times like a billion. Like it's always proven, like even the American government, I say that like even, because even the American government doesn't trust, uh, you know, Hamas. Again, New York Times, CNN, you know, there are certain you know, news reporters that, you know, like th their focus is just whatever is Hamas tells us. That's what we're going to do. 
But we know that there's fake news coming out of there. We see the body bags moving in Hamas. We see people, their videos are just a widespread of it. That the, the, you know, the people, the Palestinians, are, they're drawing makeup of blood. And, uh, you know, you have one minute they're smiling, the next minute that they're, you know, they're screaming. You see the fake mannequins that are pretending to be babies. You th- see this time and time again. Yet what does the world say? The world says that Israel is making up these things. Hamas is making these things up. Hamas shows videos that makes these things up. But the world is like, no, Israel is making things up. Like, how blind can a person be that they just show you the facts and you just go the other way? It's not moronic. It's not idiotic. It's there, There's mental deficiencies. There, there's something physically wrong in the people's brains if they can't see it. Like, people are denying what Hamas did when Hamas is telling them, no, we did it. And the people are like, yeah, we don't really want to believe you. Like, we're going to go. And Hamas is like, no, we did it. And we have evidence to prove it. And they show that evidence. Like, are you kidding me? Like, how fake is this world? How blind are people? How could, how could we get to this, to, this, to, this, to this state? The idea of anti-Semitism now is almost unreal. Like, are you, it's so obvious that one side is right and one side is wrong. And I'm not just saying that from a Jewish perspective. I'm saying it from a logical perspective. When you look at the facts on hand, when you look at history for the past 75 years since Israel was a state, it's very, very obvious. There is one side that always wanted to make peace. And did everything for peace. Gave land. Gave rights. Doesn't collect taxes. Gives them everything. And the other side says, no, all we want is to murder you. And the side that says, we want peace, says, well, if you want to murder us, we have to protect ourselves. And the world is like, genocide from Israel. Like, what? Open air prison. Are you kidding me? What would you do if someone wants to murder your children? What would you do? Would you say, like, no, like, I have to, like, just let you murder my children? Like, are you kidding me? No, any sane person stands up and defends their children. But at the same time, the Israeli government is still trying to make peace, which, again, something I don't agree with. But, but to their credit, to some extent, they're still trying. The other side is not trying. So where is the woke liberal America siding with? Like, how do we begin to understand this? When we look into, into this a little bit more in depth, we see that there's moral relativism here, like to a really high extent. These are people that, let's say, do not believe in God. So how do they define what's moral, moral and what's really morality in itself? What's morally okay and what's morally not okay? It just depends on the what, where, when, and how. They decide when it's okay to be moral and when it's not okay to be moral. They decide morality is fluid. For many people, morality is fluid. It changes as time changes. What was immoral 500 years ago for many of these people are, or, or is not moral now. Again, not the class of, immor- of, of moral relativism, but you could see that so obvious over here where you have people just with very fluid deciding what morality is on their own basis, on their own knowledge, on their own like emotions. And it comes at the price of justifying everything. And it's not just the regular people. You're talking about the media. The media is very, very important. We don't realize the media pushes... The, the, the information out to the world and the media can can cause a genocide and the media could cause a, a, a peace and harmony. And the media nowadays, especially the left media, is causing tremendous amount of destruction. They're justifying all the horrific acts. New York Times, which again is not worth the paper that it's printed on. It's garbage should be garbage. It's 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 it's, it's useless information. But they were. They claimed. I read this today. Maybe this was written yesterday or today. That you know what? What people that display posters. That's a form of activism, right? They're displaying the posters of the kidnapped children, the kidnapped women, the kidnapped men. This is a form of activism. You know what New York Times? You know said. Soon we're going to have to add Yimach Shemama. You know after that. You know what New York Times said? That removing posters. It's an own form of protest. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. It's a form of protest where you have. Pictures of people that are kidnapped and people are ripping it down. That's not 
you know, I don't know what you call it, besides anti-Semitism, racism, uh, uh, um, bru- uh, you know, signing with terrorists, that's a form of protest of what's happening in Palestine by Israelis. That's a form of protest. How do you justify that? How do you come to terms to justify what happened? Professors, 75 of them, or better yet, over 75 of them, from Columbia University, they defended the claim that the atrocities that were committed by Hamas terrorists, they were viewed as military action. And I'm going to quote for you right now one sentence. This is a direct quote from Columbia University professors, again, over 75 of them. If every political avenue available to Palestinians is blocked, we should not be surprised when resistance and violence breaks out. Really? We should not be surprised when they murder babies. We should, we should not be surprised when what they do to women. You know, one woman, the way they identified her is they had to take a, f- a fragment of her skull. After they did blank, blank, and blank to this woman and then murdered her and then did blank, 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 they destroyed her body that only was left with fragments of her skull. That's justified? Putting babies in ovens? is justified murdering kids is justified this is where they're saying we should not be no there is never never ever 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 times a million a t- point in time then someone can justify what happened on october 7th the fact that professors that are teaching the future of American people are saying that it's justified are completely siding with terrorists with barbarism and they are themselves are going to destroy American society as we know it. And mark my words, if America continues down this path of the liberal wokeism, of this, this, this uh, you know, misunderstanding of what's right and what's wrong, America is doomed it's not if this is the people that are going to be running America in the next generation, we are in big trouble. Very, very big trouble. And these are the professors that are teaching them. There is never ever a time that you could justify a fraction of what these terrorists did. No matter how I'll give you a, a, a step further. The terrorists did what they did to the to the Jewish people. If the Jewish people would have done the exactly the same thing. As a retaliation for the terrorists of what they did, in all the essence of it, from the woman to the baby to that, it would still not be justified. What meaning that even if they retaliated exactly the same way that 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 the terrorists did, that would not be justified from the Jewish people. Who gives you permission to do that to men, women, and children? The fact that there is Babies that are dying in Gaza and children that are dying in Gaza and men, women, and children that are dying in Gaza. That's not because Israel is looking for them and killing them. That's because the Hamas is placing them where Israel is is attacking. And Israel is attacking where Hamas is. So they're using them as shields and Israel is retaliating and trying to avoid casualties. And that's why there's fatalities on the other side as well. But to say that it would be justified to do what Hamas did to us, that we would do to them? Absolutely not. There will be never a situation that is justified what Hamas did. Hamas cannot justify what they did. Even the terrorists that were captured say that it was not right what they did. According to the Muslim law, it was not right what they did. They are saying that they are wrong for what they did. Again, they may not say that we shouldn't have done it, but they're saying according to Islamic law, they shouldn't have done what they did. They're not allowed to kill women. They're not allowed to kill children. They're not allowed to do what they did. Yet there are liberal Americans in Ivy League universities that are standing up for them and say what you did was right. And if that's not enough, there are professors. 75 professors, are you kidding me? It's not one. 75 of them, they're defending what Hamas did. There's no justification for that. So we have to realize, wait a minute, what's going on over here? This is not normal logical thinking. You can't come to these conclusions normal through through you know based off based off logic. This is not a normal thing. So when we look into this a little bit more, there is even more confusion that comes in to try to understand this. Most schools, universities, there's an anti hate or speech in their charter. And you know what it calls for? Immediate expulsion. 
Universities, however, have been very, very slow to act against the hate of Jewish people. And imagine if you replace this anti-Semitism with hatred of, against any other nationality, color, religion. Imagine the uproar of society. Imagine the uproar if this would have been to the Asian community. Imagine the uproar if this would have been to the Christian community. Imagine the uproar. But when it comes to Jewish people, people tend to forget. They don't use their equality brains. Nowadays, nowadays, the crazy thing is, is in universities, in colleges, you can't call a man a man or a woman a woman. You have to respect someone if they identify as they, them, we, or their gender fluid. Gender fluid means that they could change what gender they identify at any point in time. One day a woman, one day a man. That's a mental disorder. That's a But you know what? These equality people are standing up. We have to make sure not to hurt them. They, them, we, when, them, all the nonsense, you know, equality, whatever, gibberish that they come out with. Why? Why are we so careful about the correct pronouns in university? You want to know why? Because we care about everyone. We want them not, we don't want to hurt their feelings. Oh, yeah, but to the murder of Jews, the screaming of Jews, that's okay? If it's Jews, then, you know, like, and it's murder. It's not hurting feelings. You're signing with murder. These are the same people that are claiming equality for the correct use of pronouns and whatnot are the same ones that are screaming from the river to the sea. How does that work? How do you de decide that this is okay and this is not okay? Who gave you the authority to say, you know what? Well, for these people, we're going to treat them equally. For these people, we're going to make sure not to hurt their feeling. For these people, though, we're going to scare them till they have to run into the attics of, of colleges. We're going to scare them that they're going to be scared of their life. We're going to scare them that they cannot eat with anybody else because of the fearful you know, abuse that's going on online. These are the same people. How do you do how, This is moral relativism. This is the idea where they decide this is okay and this is not. Their brains that are barely developed, the, 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 the mental disorders that most of these people have, with, with all due respect, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I, people, mental disorder is a real thing. These people are beyond that. Like, like you know, like, this is, this is I, I, whatever. I, I can't even begin to, <laughs> to explain the idiocracy, the stupidity, the moron, the, 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 the lack of intellect that these people have. And this is the conclusion that they come to. And this is the generation that we're dealing with. There, there, there was a, a, a video that was circulating throughout the news. This made it into the news somehow. I don't know why. Like Lately, I've been obviously very invested in the news. I've, usually, I'm not invested in the news. I don't really know what's going on. But I see how dumb the world is. It, it's scary. It's scary. It's, it's kind of comical at, to the same point in time. You had somebody where, there that they were shocked that you have to work nine to five. There was a, this video. I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about. They were shocked that they have to work nine to five. They have no time for anything else. How are they going to do their TikToks and Instagrams and, and whatnot? They're so shocked that they have to work. You know, the nine to five. The previous generation would work two to three jobs to make ends meet. The blue collar world. Like, and they're shocked that they have to work one job to make ends meet. There is a feeling of entitlement in the in the American the, the young American society, which is very scary because that's the future of America. There's a fe there's there's a feeling of entitlement. It, it, this the entitlement also goes into what they expect Israel. You know what Israel should do? Israel, they claim, should give into Gaza, accept all the punishment, and do nothing in return. There is a public school teacher, not Islamic, a public school teacher that comes out and says, "I want, I don't want to cease fire. I only want one side to cease fire," and. When I was reading this, I was like, okay, they want Hamas to cease fire. Because you know what happens if Hamas does you know, a ceasefire? Again, now it's not good to do a ceasefire uh, because Hamas is just going to build up. But if you know what, if Hamas drops their weapons, there will be peace. If Israel drops their weapons, there is not going to be a Jewish state. You know what this public school, American public school teacher said? I want a ceasefire from one side and one side only, and that's Israel. Meaning, she basically wants the annihilation of the entire Jewish state. The entire Jewish thing. That, that, that's, all, that's all she cares about. The feeling of entitlement on this woke generation. These, pe the, these people think that they're great. These people are monsters. They are straight out 
monsters. They make their decisions based on their emotions. It's not about logic, because if you look at the logic, Israel is right, Hamas is wrong. That's what logic dictates. If you look at logic through relationships, these people mess up their own relationships. They fall in out of love. They fall out of love. They, 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 they make a marriage commitment for 30 years, and then they decide, you know what? I don't feel like I love you anymore, so I think that someone's better out there than, than me, and they just drop their commitments. This is They're making their decisions based off emotions. And when I say they, I, you know, it, we have to be careful because it's creeping into us. We also make our decisions emotionally. And we have to realize we have to make our decisions log logically. And these people, the liberal America, they think they would re if they would realize what Hamas wants, Hamas said straight out, Hamas commander straight out said, the commander Mahmoud al-Zahar said that he wants the entire planet to be under our law. So people in America are like pro-Palestine, pro-this, and pro-queer, pro pro-everything pro else. Hamas wants you dead. Hamas wants to take over your country. The Palestinians want to take over your country. The Islam, Islam wants to take over, not, not everyone, but many of them want to take over your country, make it under Islamic law. That's not a democracy. So you want to, you're basically supporting to give up all your rights and live under Sharia law. Like, that's what you're supporting. The scary thing is, the scary thing is, is that all these people that are so twisted, they think that they are right. They think that they're great people. They think that they're the most moral people. They want equality. They want gender. And they're focusing on the un underdog. And they're focusing on the Palestinian. And they're focusing on all this side that is going through suffering and scariness. And they, in their mind, they think they're great. These human rights activists, the United Nations, which was created to, to do good, is doing nothing but problems. The liberals themselves, they think they're most amazing people. And that's the scary thing. That's a scary thing. We're almost done. Bear with me a few more minutes. The, I'll tell you how scary this, you know, this aspect is. There's a Pusik by the Akita uh, that in Bereshus chapter 22, verse 7, that says, Avram. Yitzhak said to his father, Avram, Aviv, my father. Vayomer Avi, and he said, my father. Vayomer hineni b'ni, and Avram responded, here I am, my son. Vayomer hineni ha'eshva eitzim ba'ayasa ha'asa la'ayla. And Yitzhak says, I see the, I see the fire, I see the wood, but I don't see the ram for it to, 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 you know, to, to bring up as a carbon. And let me give you the backstory behind this, and this is how everybody Fran explains it. The, 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 when we look at this Pasuk, there's something that sticks out. Why does it say father twice in this Pasuk? It says, Vayemir Yitzhakel Avram Aviv, Vayemir Avi. Why? That's very odd, you know, the, the linguistic, you know, the, 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 the terminology, the verbiage that the Torah uses is very interesting where it says, utilizes the word Aviv twice. So you want to know why? The Medrash explains, you don't want to know, want to know why the, the, this, there's two terminology of the word Aviv, father? It's because the Satan did not want that Keda to happen. They did not want that Avram Avinu should sacrifice his son Yitzchak to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know, and, 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 and the Satan tried so hard. They went over to Avram and says, you waited a hundred years for your son. Now you're going to go and slaughter him? And Avram responded, if this is what God wants, then this is what God wants, and I'm going to do what God wants. And then he tried a bunch of other, you know, tricks with Avram Avinu, and it didn't work. So he went over to Yitzchak, and this is the background to this story, to this, to this Pasuk. And he went over to Yitzhak, and Yitzhak, and, and the Sultan goes, he says, you know, your father is going to slaughter you. You know what Yitzhak responded? I know that. But if this is what my God wants, this is what my God told my father, I'm going to go with it. So then the Sultan tried another tactic. But what about your poor mother? Right? Which, everybody loves their mother. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your mother? Your mother who waited all these years to have a child, she will be devastated by this. But Yitzhak said, if this is what God wants, I'm going to stick by it. But then the Satan said something very interesting, and it shook Yitzhak to the core. And that is that the Satan persisted and told Yitzhak that all the beautiful clothing that your mother made for you, your Shmuel, is going to inherit them, and you will have nothing. And this caused Yitzhak to pause, says the Medrash. And Yitzhak cried out to his father, my father twice, Aviv than Avi, he said twice to have mercy on him. Because when the Satan said this, it hit a chord, and that's why Yitzhak used the word, used the word father twice in this Pasuk. He used it twice to invoke some mercy on his father. He said, what caused Yitzhak now to be all of a sudden fearful and ask for mercy of his father? Yitzhak was okay 
when he was going to be sacrificed. Yitzhak was okay that he wasn't, that his father waited so long for have a child, and now he's going to be sacrificed. Yitzhak was okay that his mother was going to go through a very difficult time because she's waited so long for her son, and now it was being sacrificed. But you know what caused Yitzhak hesitancy? You know what caused Yitzhak to say, wait a minute, stop what's going on? When he, when the Sultan said, your Shmuel is going to take your clothes, and you're not going to have anything. How do we make sense of that? So our friend was had you know went and asked and he quotes this from Rabbi Goldberger, and listen to this. Listen to this fascinating idea. We find in Chazal that Asaf sometimes appears to be a wicked person, a wicked thief, and sometimes they appear to be a Tamil chacham. Sometimes they appear a righteous, uh, a righteous person. And the meaning behind this is that we have to be aware of our spiritual enemies and what type of dress they appear. They could appear as righteous people and they could appear as wicked people. And here too, explains Rabbi Goldberger, that the Medrash is trying to explain to us that Yishmael can dress up like Yitzchak's in Yitzchak's clothing. They could dress up in, Yish, in Yitzchak's garb and they could look like Yitzchak. You know what that means? That means that they would give people the impression that the wicked Yishmael is really righteous. It's going to give the impression that the wicked people of the world are really righteous. And this is what Yitzchak felt. I cannot allow that. I cannot allow him, what does that mean to wear his clothing? Yitzhak didn't care about the clothing. He was willing to sacrifice himself. He didn't care about, you know, if he had a Dolce Gabbana, you know, clothing over there. He couldn't care less about those things. So, but what he cared about is that if Ishmael wore the clothing, what that meant was that he would be pretending to be righteous. He would be pretending to be right. That's what he was fearful for. If he would say, Yitzhak, Yitzhak, he's going to seduce people saying that he's me. I, I was righteous my whole life, and Yishmael is going to go and pretend to be righteous? That's something that's going to cause me hesitancy. And that's something that he goes does and tells Abraham Avinu, you know, his father says, maybe we need to have a, to think this over, and maybe have mercy on me. And that's what he said, Aviv and Aviv. And of course, Yishmael wouldn't, you know, Yitzhak wouldn't go and, and, and remove himself from the situation because of that, but he did real, this did bring him to some sort of hesitancy. And this is what we see nowadays. Yishmael and the people that are supporting them, they all pretend to be good people. And they all pretend, and we see this historically. The, the Historically, anti-Semitism was either they wanted to kill us or they behaved nicely towards us so that we can assimilate. Both equals the end of Jews. We have to realize who our enemies are and how they dress up and how they pretend to be. We see the liberal America and how they're supporting the, the, you know, who and which side they're supporting and, the, the, they're, and they pretend to be good. They're dressing up like Yitzhak but behaving like Ishmael. They, they think to themselves that they're great people but they're doing the most despicable, the disgusting thing. Things. They are the most horrific, horrible people in the world. They're doing the most difficult, the, and they're justifying all of it. Moral relativism, moral relativity. They're, they're considering themselves to be of such high standards, of accepting of everyone, yet they destroy everything. And that is what we have to be careful during this time, during this time of anti-Semitism. So let's try to recap this, and then we'll open up for any questions. There are four lessons that we learned today. Lesson number one, when we look at anti-Semitism, we have to realize that things do not occur at random. Just like Avram Avinu, when the, when the angels came, he said, this is not at random that you're coming here today. There's a reason that you're coming here today, and we have to go and act upon that reason. We have to realize there's anti-Semitism in the world. There is horrific massacre that happened in the world. There's horrific things that happen in the world, whether it's our test or anybody else's test. There is, it's not at random. There is a reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing it. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is that we don't always see the full reason. What sometimes appears bad, we look at the news and we say, this is terrible, this is anti-Semitism, this is very bad for the Jews. We don't know how, how HaKadosh Baruch Hu could twist that around and make that the salvation of the Jewish people. That's lesson number two. Lesson number three is not is 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 to, to realize that we have a loving Father in heaven. And everything that's happening, it's happening for a good reason. And when we're looking at that, we can ingest the news very, very differently. We shouldn't be happy, of course, for the things that are happening to us, but we'll realize and we'll know how to ingest the information. We know that if we see difficult things in the world that is happening to the Jewish people, we have to realize what are we going to do different? What are we going to do tshuva? Are we going, what are we going to change different in our lives? And finally, the final lesson 
that we learned tonight is that the enemy has very clearly shown its face. We know who the enemy is. They are, and they're stating it straight out. The world is splitting sides. This is this topic that we spoke about last week. The world is splitting up to the side of good and evil. We see who the enemy is and we see who we can rely on. And the essence of who we can rely on, the truth of the matter is, we can't rely on anyone. We can only rely on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We can only rely on God. We can only rely on each other. We can only have that unity. That's who we can rely on. We have been fooled time and time again. We have tried everything. We have tried to assimilate. We have tried to behave like nothing works. You want to know why? Because as much as we try to run away, God will tell us you cannot run away because you are special. You are different. You are the chosen nation. And we look at anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism prevents us from dissipating into the, in, into the horizon. It, it, it prevents us from disappearing. So we have to utilize these lessons and we have to double down and say, you know what? We're not going to stand down. We're not going to. St- we're not going to back out. We're going to stand up and be Jewish the way that we ought to be. We're not going to go and assimilate. We're not going to look like everyone else. We're going to stand up and we're going to be Jewish as Jewish people can be. We're going to stand up for who we are and what we believe in, and nothing, and I mean nothing, can back us down. And with that, we'll open up to questions. Okay. Here's an interesting question. Is it better to donate to Torah anytime or IDF currently? I believe it's better to donate. Both need money, but I believe it's better to donate to Torah anytime because Torah is what's going to protect. There is bulletproof vests from physical and there's bulletproof vests spiritual. The spiritual bulletproof vest works a lot better than the physical bulletproof vest. But again, both need, but I believe my personal opinion, and many rabbis would agree with me, donate to Torah anytime. Is it, next question. Is it bad if you feel like you don't think about the situation in Israel all the time? I'm an empathetic person, but I don't go on the news and watch the videos online. So this is a great question because people will come to the point that they feel like they can't enjoy life because if they join life, they feel guilty. They feel bad if they're not empathetic, if they're not crying all the time, it's very bad. That is not the correct outlook. Yes, we should feel for Eretz Yisrael and it should be on a daily basis and we should be davening for them. And it's our brothers and our sisters and our Eretz Yisrael and, uh, you know, actually that being said, we have to say our capital to Helen, which we forgot to say, which I'll say it after this this uh, uh, this question. But we also have to realize that it's not a, if if you're not going in the news, you should, it's better not to go in the news and if you're not oh you could still go and you could still do the things that you need to do you have to live life the way that you need to but obviously there's things that you need to change and you need to focus on on you know on the better but that doesn't mean that you have to stop living and stop enjoying life but with that let us say the capital to hell for our soldiers and our Israel and our brothers and sisters and our Israel that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should protect them and save them. And we'll say Kapitol Lamed like we always do during this time. Shir Hama'alais, Mima'amakim Karasicha Adonai. Adonai Shema Bekoili, Tiena Aznecha Kashu, Vaisa Kol Tachanunai. Im Avoinais Tish, Maria Adonai Mi Amoid. Ki Im Cha Aslicha Lema Antivare. Ki Visi Adonai Kiv, So Nafshi, Vilidvarai Hoi Chalti. Nafshi la doinoi mi shaymim la baiker, shaymim la baiker. Yachel Israel el adoinoi, ki im adoinoi achesed vahabei moi fedus. Vuhu yiftes Israel mi kohol avoinoi sov. Achenu kol bais Israel. Hanesunim batsara uva shivya. Haim dim bain bayam u bain bayabasha. Hamakam yirachim alem, vietziem mitsara lervacha. Ume afela le ara, umi shibud le geula, hashta bagala bizman kariv vinemar amen. Okay, let's go into um, next question. Um, isn't it halacha for all these people to hate us? It's definitely not halacha um, that they need to hate us, but because you'll see many people, and this is the sides that's happening. Now, and by the time of Mashiach comes, the world is going to be divided into two. One side is going to survive and the others is not. The people that are against us, I guarantee you, are not going to fare well during the time of Mashiach. And Mashiach, it's coming. It's close. Um, yeah, a narcissistic personality disorder. Very true. Uh, you know, and what we said before. Okay, next. Um, so what I'm hearing is people have to wake up. And if we don't, it's not going to look good. Anything we can do to wake up American Jews... Um, 
who are so assimilated. Rabbi, I'm trying to get Mashiach here and avoid any more harm to us Jews. 100%, I agree with you. And yes, we do need to wake up. We do. We definitely do need to wake up. And that's what we need to do. We, we, that, that is our goal. This is our focus. One of the main things that Kaddish Baruch Hu is sending us is saying, wake up. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Looks like that was all. Th- those were all the questions. Thank you all for joining. And Emirat Hashem, by the time next week class, we should if next week comes, we should need, need to have a class, or maybe we would, but it should be with uh, Mashiach b'Mehira b'Yamenu.